Hi guys, this is Miss Marshall again, and we are now going to be reading pages 93 through 138 of part two of the book Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson. And let's see. So again, just to remind you, uh, part two is called The Stories of South Carolina, Run Like Rivers. Okay. All right. We're just going to jump right in. The Leavers. We watch men leave Greenville in their one good suit, shoes, spit shined. We watch women leave in Sunday clothes, hatted and lipsticked and white gloved. We watch them catch buses in the evening, the black shadows of their backs, the last we see of them. Others fill their cars with bags, whole families disappearing into the night, people waving goodbye. They say the city is a place where diamonds speckle the sidewalk, money falls from the sky. They say a colored person can do well going there. All you need is the fair out of Greenville. All you need is to know somebody on the other side waiting to cross you over, like the River Jordan. And then you're in paradise. The beginning of leaving. When my mother returns from New York, she has a new plan. All of us are going to move there. We don't know any place else but Greenville now. New York is only the picture she shows us in magazines and the two she has in her pocketbook of our Aunt Kay. In one, there are two other people standing with her. Bernie and Peaches, our mother tells us. We all used to be friends here in Nickeltown. That's all the young kids used to talk about, our grandmother tells us, going to New York City. My mother smiles at us and says, we'll be going to New York City. I just have to figure some things out first. That's all. I don't know what I'd do without you all up under me, my grandmother says, and there's a sadness in her voice. Don't know what I'd do, she says again even sadder this time. As a child, I smelled the air. Mama takes her coffee out to the front porch, sips it slow. Two steps down and her feet are covered in grass and dew. New York doesn't smell like this, she says. I follow her, the dew cool against my feet the soft hush of wind through leaves, my mother and I, alone together. Her coffee is sweetened with condensed milk, her hair pulled back into a braid, her dark fingers circling her cup. If I ask, she will hold it to my lips. Let me taste the bitter sweet of it. It's dawn and the birds have come alive, chasing each other from maple to pine and back to maple again. This is how time passes here. The maple will be bare branched come winter, Mama says, but the pines, they just keep on living. And the air is what I'll remember, even once we move to New York. It always smelled like this, my mother says, wet grass and pine, like memory. Harvest time. When daddy's garden is ready, it is filled with words that make me laugh when I say them. Whole beans and tomatoes, okra and corn, sweet peas and sugar snaps, lettuce and squash. Who could have imagined so much color that the ground disappears and we are left walking through an autumn's worth of crazy words that beneath the magic of my grandmother's hands become side dishes. Grown Folk Stories. Warm autumn night with the crickets crying, the smell of pine coming soft on the wind, and the women on porch, on the porch, quilts across their laps. Aunt Lucinda, Ms. Bell, 
and whatever neighbor has a breath or two left at the end of the day for sitting and running our mouths. That's when we listen to the grown folks talking, Hope, Dell, and me sitting quiet on the stairs. We know one word from us will bring a hush upon the women. My grandmother's finger suddenly pointing toward the house, her soft spoken, I think it's time for you kids to go to bed now, ushering us into our room. So we are silent, our backs against posts in the back of the stairs. Hope's elbows on his knees, head down. Now is when we learn everything there is to know about the people down the road and in the day workhouses, about the sisters at the Kingdom Hall and the faraway relatives we really see. Long after the stories are told, I remember them, whisper them back to Hope and Dell late into the night. She's the one who left Nickeltown in the daytime the one grandmama says wasn't afraid of anything, retelling each story, making up what I didn't understand or missed when voices dropped too low. I talk until my sister and brother's soft breaths tell me they've fallen asleep. Then I let the stories live inside my head again and again until the real world fades back into cricket lullabies in my own dreams. Tobacco. Summer is over, a kiss of chill in the southern air. We see the dim orange of my grandfather's cigarette as he makes his way down the darkening road. Hear his evening greetings and the coughing that follows them. Not enough breath left now to sing, so I sing for him in my head, where only I can hear. Where will the wedding supper be? Way down yonder in a hollow tree. Uh mm hmm the old people used to say a pinch of dirt in the mouth can tell tobacco's story. What crops are ready for picking? What needs to be left to grow? What soil is rich enough for planting? And the patches of land that need a year of rest. We do not know yet how sometimes the earth makes a promise it can never keep. Tobacco fields lay fallow, crops picked clean. My grandfather coughs again and the earth waits for what and who it will get in return. How to listen, number three. Middle of the night, my grandfather is coughing. Me, upright, startled. My mother leaving Greenville. It is late autumn now, the smell of wood burning, the pot stove like a warm, soft hand in the center of my grandparents' living room, its black pipe stretching into the ceiling, then disappearing. So many years have passed since we last saw our father, his absence like a bubble in my older brother's life that pops again and again to a whole lot of tiny bubbles of memory. You were just a baby, he says to me. You're so lucky you don't remember the fighting or anything. It's like erasers came through her memory, my sister says. Erase, erase, erase. But now my mother is leaving again. This I will remember. Halfway home, number one. New York, my mother says. Soon I'll find us a place there. Come back and bring you all home. She wants a place of her own that is not the Nelsonville house, the Columbus house, the Greenville house. Looking for her next place, our next place. Right now, our mother says, we're only halfway home. And I imagine her standing in the middle of a road, her arms out, fingers pointing north and south. I want to ask, will there always be a road? Will there always be a bus? Will we always have to choose between home and home? My mother looks back on Greenville. After our dinner and bath, after our powdered and pajamaed bodies are tucked three across into bed, after Winnie the Pooh and kisses on our foreheads and a longer than usual hugs, my mother walks away from the house on Hall Street out into the growing night 
down a long dusty road to where the Nickeltown bus takes her to the Greyhound station. Then more dust, then she's gone. New York ahead of her, her family behind. She moves to the back, her purse in her lap, the land pulling her gaze to the window once more before darkness covers it. And for many hours, there are only shadows and stars and tears and hope. The last fireflies. We know our days are counted here. Each evening we wait for the first light of the last fireflies, catch them in jars and then let them go again. As though we understand their need for freedom. As though our silent prayers to stay in Greenville will be answered if we do what we know is right. Changes. Now the evenings are quiet with my mother gone as though the night is listening to the way we are counting the days. We know even the feel of our grandmother's brush being pulled gently through our hair will fast become a memory. Those Saturday evenings at her kitchen table, the smell of Dixie peach hair grease, the sizzle of the straightening comb, the hiss of the iron against damp, newly washed ribbons. All of this may happen again, but in another place. We sit on our grandparents' porch, shivering already against the coming winter, and talk softly about Greenville summer. How when we come back, we'll do all the stuff we always did. Hear the same stories, laugh at the same jokes, catch fireflies in the same mason jars, promise each other future summers that are as good as the past. But we know we are lying. Coming home will be different now. This place called Greenville, this neighborhood called Nickeltown will change some, and so will each of us. Sterling High School, Greenville. While my mother is away in New York City, a fire sweeps through her old high school during a senior dance. Smoke filled the crowded room and the music stopped and the students dancing stopped and the DJ told them to quickly leave the building. The fire lasted all night, and when it was over, my mother's high school had burned nearly to the ground. My mother said it was because the students had been marching, and the marching made some white people in Greenville mad. After the fire, the students weren't allowed to go to the all whites high school. Instead, they had to crowd in beside their younger sisters and brothers at the lower school. In the photos from my mother's high school yearbook, The Torch, 1959, my mother is smiling beside her cousin, Dorothy Ann, and on her other side, there's Jesse Jackson, who maybe was already dreaming of one day being the first brown man to run for president. And not even the torching of their school could stop him or the marchers from changing the world. Faith. After my mother leaves, my grandmother pulls us further into the religion she has always known. We become Jehovah's Witnesses like her. After my mother leaves, there is no one to say, the children can choose their own faith when they're old enough. In my house, my grandmother says, you will do as I do. After my mother leaves, we wake in the middle of the night calling out for her. Have faith, my grandmother says, pulling us to her in the darkness. Let the Bible, my grandmother says, become your sword and your shield. But we do not know yet who we are fighting and what we are fighting for. The stories Cora tells. In the evening now, Cora and her sisters come over to our porch. There are three of them and three of us, but Hope moves away from the girls, sits by himself out in the yard. And even though my grandmother tells us not to play with them, she doesn't call us into the house anymore when she sees them walking down the road. Maybe her heart moves over a bit, making room for them. A colorful mushroom grows beneath the pine tree, purple and gold and strange against the pine needled ground. 
When I step on it, Cora and her sisters scream at me. You just killed the devil while he was sleeping, sleeping in his own house. Cora warns me the devil will soon be alive again. She says, he's going to come for you late in the night while you're sleeping. And the God y'all pray to won't be there protecting you. I cry as the sun sets, waiting, crying till my grandmother comes out, shoes Cora and her sisters home, holds me tight, tells me they are lying. That's just some crazy Southern superstition, my grandmother says. Those girls must be a little simple, not knowing a mushroom when they see one. Don't believe everything you hear, Jackie. Someday you'll come to know when someone is telling the truth and when they're just making up stories. Hall Street. In the early evening, just before the best light for hide and seek takes over the sky, it's Bible study time. We watch from our places on the front porch, our cold hands cupped around hot chocolate, half gone and sweetest at the bottom, as the brother and sister from the Kingdom Hall make their way up our road. Pretty Monday evening, the brother from the Kingdom Hall says. Thank Jehovah, the sister from the Kingdom Hall says back. We are silent, Brother Hope, Sister Dell, and me. None of us want to sit inside when the late autumn is calling to us and frogs are finally feeling brave enough to hop across our yard. We want anything but this. We want warm biscuits and tag and jacks on the porch, our two long sweater sleeves getting in the way sometimes. But we are Jehovah's Witnesses. Monday night is Bible study time. Somewhere else, my grandfather is spending time with his brother, Verdi. Maybe they are playing the harmonica and banjo, laughing and singing loud, doing what's fun to do on a pretty Monday evening. Jehovah promises us everlasting life in the new world, the brother from the Kingdom Hall says. And Brother Hope, Sister Dell, and me are silent, wanting only what's right outside, wanting only this world. Soon. When the phone rings in my grandmother's kitchen, we run from wherever we are, jumping from the front porch swing, climbing out of the mud-filled ditch out back, running quick from the picked clean garden. But my brother Hope is the fastest, picking up the phone, pressing it hard against his ear, as though my mother's voice just that much closer means my mother is closer to us. We jump around him, let me speak, until my grandmother comes through the screen door puts down the basket of laundry, cold and dry from the line, takes the phone from my brother, shushes us, shoes us, promises us a moment with our mother soon. How I learn the days of the week. Monday night is Bible study with a brother and sister from Kingdom Hall. Tuesday night is Bible study at the Kingdom Hall. Wednesday night is laundry night, the clothes blowing clean on the line above my grandfather's garden. When no one is looking, we run through the sheets, breathe in all the wonderful smells the air adds to them. Thursday night is ministry school. One day, we will grow up to preach God's word, take it out into the world, and maybe we'll save some people. Friday night, we're free as anything, Hope and Dell's bikes skidding along Hall Street, my knees bumping hard against the handlebars of my red three-wheeler. One more year, maybe Dell's bike will be mine. Saturday, we're up early, the watchtower and awake in our hands, and we walk the sleepy we walk like sleepy soldiers through Nickeltown, ringing bells, knocking on doors, spreading the good news of something better coming. Sometimes the people listen. Sometimes they slam their doors or don't open them at all. Or look sadly down at me, ribboned and starched, my face clean and shining with oil, my words earnest as anything. Good morning, I'm Sister Jacqueline and I'm here to bring you some good news today. Sometimes they give me a dime but won't take my watchtower and awake. Sunday, it's watchtower study at the Kingdom Hall. 
two hours of sitting and sitting and sitting. Then Monday comes and the week starts all over again. Ribbons. They are pale blue or pink or white. They're neatly ironed each Saturday night. Come Sunday morning, they are tied to the braids, hanging down past our ears. We wear ribbons every day except Saturday when we've washed them by hand. Dell and I side by side at the kitchen sink, rubbing them with ivory soap, then rinsing them beneath cool water. Each of us dreaming of the day our grandmother says, you're too old for ribbons. But it feels like that day will never come. When we hang them on the line to dry, we hope they'll blow away in the night breeze, but they don't. Come morning, they're right where we left them, gently moving into the cool air, eager to anchor us to childhood. Two gods, two worlds. It's barely morning and we're already awake. My grandmother in the kitchen ironing our Sunday clothes. I can hear daddy coughing in his bed. A cough he'll never catch, a cough like he'll never catch his breath. The sound catches in my chest as I'm pulling my dress over my head. Hold my own breath until the coughing stops. Still, I hear him pad through the living room, hear the squeak of the front screen door, and know he's made it to the porch swing to smoke a cigarette. My grandfather doesn't believe in a God that won't let him smoke or have a cold beer on a Friday night. A God that tells us all the world is ending so that y'all walk through this world afraid as cats. Your God is not my God, he says. His cough moves through the air, back into our room where the light is almost blue, the white winter sun painting it. I wish the coughing would stop. I wish he would put on Sunday clothes, take my hand, walk with us down the road. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that everyone who doesn't follow God's word will be destroyed in a great battle called Armageddon. And when the battle is done, there will be a fresh new world, a nicer, more peaceful world. But I want the world where my daddy is, and I don't know why anybody's God would make me have to choose. Well, God knows. We pray for my grandfather, ask God to spare him, even though he's a non-believer. We ask that Jehovah look into his heart, see the goodness there. But my grandfather says he doesn't need our prayers. I work hard, he says. I treat people like I want to be treated. God sees this. God knows. At the end of the day, he lights a cigarette, unlaces his dusty brogans, Stretches his legs. God sees my good, he says. Do all the preaching and praying you want, but no need to do it for me. New Playmates. Beautiful brown dolls come from New York City. Fancy stores my mother has walked into. She writes of elevators, train stations, buildings so high they hurt the neck to see. She writes of places with beautiful names, Coney Island, Harlem, Brownsville, Bear Mountain. She tells us she's seen the ocean, how the water keeps going long after the eyes can't see it anymore. Promises a whole other country on the other side. She tells us the toy stores are filled with dolls of every size and color. There's a barber shop and a hair salon everywhere you look. And a friend of Aunt Kay's saw Lena Horn just walking down the street. But only the dolls are real to us. Their black hair in stiff curls down over their shoulders. Their pink dresses made of crinoline and satin. Their dark arms unbending. Still, we hug their hard plastic close and imagine they're calling us mama. Imagine they need us near. Imagine the letters from our own mother coming to get you soon are ones we're writing to them. We will never leave you, we whisper. They stare back at us, blank-eyed and beautiful, silent and still. Down the road. 
Be careful when you play with him, my grandmother warns us about the boy with, this hole, with the hole in his heart. Don't make him run too fast or cry. When he taps on our front door, we come out, sit quietly with him on the back stairs. He doesn't talk much, the bo this boy with the hole in his heart. But when he does, it's to ask a, us about our mother in New York City. Is she afraid there? Did she ever meet a movie star? Do the buildings really go on and on? One day, he says, so soft my brother, sister, and I lean into here. I'm going to go to New York City. Then he looks off towards Cora's house down the road. That's south, my sister says. New York's the other way. God's promise. It's nearly Christmas time. On the radio, a man with a soft, deep voice is singing, telling us to have ourselves a merry little. Nickel Town windows are filled with Christmas trees. Cora and her sisters brag about what they're getting, dolls and skates and swing sets. In the backyard, our own swing set is silent, a thin layer of snow covering it. When we are made to stay inside on Sunday afternoons, Cora and her sisters descend upon it, take the swings up high, stick their tongues out at us as we stare from behind our glassed-in screen door. Let them play, for heaven's sakes, my grandmother says, when we complain about them tearing it apart. Your hearts are bigger than that. But our hearts aren't bigger than that. Our hearts are tiny and mad. If our hearts were hands, they'd hit. If our hearts were feet, they'd surely kick somebody. The other infinity. We are the chosen people, our grandmother tells us. Everything we do is a part of God's plan. Every breath you breathe is the gift God is giving you. Everything we own. Daddy gave us the swings, my sister tells her. Not God. This lesson. My grandmother's words come slowly meaning this lesson is an important one. With the money he earned by working at a job, God gave him a body strong enough to work with. Outside, our swing set is empty, finally. Cora and her sisters now gone. Hope, Dell, and I are silent. So much we don't yet understand. So much we don't yet believe. But we know this, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday are reserved for God's work. We are put here to do it, and we are expected to do it well. What is promised to us in return is eternity. It's the same, my sister says, or maybe even better than infinity. The empty swing set reminds us of this that what is bad won't be bad forever, and that what is good can sometimes last a long, long time. Even Cora and her sisters can only bother us for a little while before they get called home to supper. Sometimes no words are needed. Deep winter and the night air is cold, so still, it feels like the world goes on forever in the darkness until you look up and the earth stops in a ceiling of stars. My head against my grandfather's arm, a blanket around us as we sit on the front porch swing. It's whine like a song. You don't need words on a night like this, just the warmth of your grandfather's arm, just the silent promise that the world as we know it will always be here. The letter. The letter comes on Saturday morning. My sister opens it. My mother's handwriting is easy, my sister says. She doesn't write in script. She writes so we can understand her. And then she reads my mother's letter slowly while Hope and I sit at the kitchen table. Cheese grits near gone, scrambled eggs leaving yellow dots in our bowls. My grandmother's beloved biscuits forgotten. She's coming for us, my sister says, and reads the part where my mother tells her the plan. 
We're really leaving Greenville, my sister says, and Hope sits up straighter and smiles. But then the smile is gone. How can we have both places? How can we leave all that we've known? Me on daddy's lap in the early evening, listening to Hope and Dell tell stories about their lives at the small school a mile down the road. I will be five one day and the Nickeltown school is a mystery I'm just about to solve. And what about the fireflies and ditches? And what about the nights when we all climb into our grandparents' bed and they move apart, making room for us in the middle? And maybe that's when my sister reads the part I don't hear. A baby coming, another one a brother or sister, still in her belly, but coming soon. She's coming to get us, my sister says again, looking around our big yellow kitchen, then running her hand over the hardwood table as though she's already gone and trying to remember this. One morning, late winter. Then one morning, my grandfather is too sick to walk the half mile to the bus that takes him to work. He stays in bed for the whole day, waking only to cough and cough and cough. I walk slowly around him, fluffing his pillows, pressing cool cloths over his forehead, telling him the stories that come to me again and again. This I can do, find him another place to be, when this world is choking him. Tell me a story, he says, and I do. New York baby. When my mother returns, I will no longer be her baby girl. I'm sitting on my grandmother's lap when she tells me this. Already so tall, my legs dangle far down, the tips of my toes touching the porch mat. My head rests on her shoulder now where once it came only to her collarbone. She smells the way she always does, of pine saw and cotton, Dixie peach hair grease, and something warm and powdery. I want to know whose baby girl I'll be when my mother's new baby comes, born where the sidewalks sparkle, and me, just a regular girl. I didn't know how much I loved being everybody's baby girl, until now when my life as a baby girl is nearly over. Leaving Greenville. My mother arrives in the middle of the night and sleepily we pile into her arms and hold tight. Her kiss on the top of my head reminds me of all I love, mostly her. It is late winter, but my grandmother keeps the window in our room slightly open so that the cold, fresh air can move over us as we, as we sleep. Two thick quilts and the three of us side by side by side. This is all we know now. Cold pine breezes, my grandmother's quilts, the heat of the wood-burning stove, the sweet, slow voices of the people around us, red dust wafting, then settling, as though it said all it needs to say. My mother tucks us back into our bed, whispering, we have a home up north now. I'm too sleepy to tell her that Greenville is home, that even in the wintertime, the crickets sing us to sleep. And tomorrow morning, you'll get to meet your new baby brother. But I am already mostly asleep again, two arms wrapped tight around my mama's hand. Roman, his name is as strange as he is, this new baby brother, so pale and quiet and wide-eyed. He sucks his fist, taking in all of us without blinking. Another boy, Hope says. Now it's even Stephen around here. But I don't like the new baby of the family. I want to send it back to wherever babies live before they get here. When I pinch him, a red mark stays behind, and his cry is high and tiny, a sound that hurts my ears. That's what you get, my sister says. His crying is him fighting you back. Then she picks him up, holds him close, tells him softly everything's all right. Everything's always going to be all right. Until Roman gets quiet, his wide black eyes looking only at Dell, as if he believes her. Okay, so that is the end of part two. And 
I will be back at some point to read you part three. Thanks so much.